we've been talking about a lot of 2020. And I don't think I've ever done anything quite like I'm about to do, mainly because reading you excerpts from a book is boring. However, when I walked in the office the other day, at 24-7 right now, I'm allowed in this building, Colin's allowed in this building, that's about it. No one else comes in the building. There would normally be like thousands of people in this entire complex right now, but we're the only two allowed here. So the mail piles up and, you know, we got to change the tablets and the coffee machine to keep it um, fresh and sanitized and stuff. So one of the perks is we get sent a lot of free stuff. Like you can talk about the health benefits of working here all you want to. The best perk of working at 24-7 is we get all the preview magazines for free and we get all these books sent to us by the authors for free. And that's great because... I'm a guy who loves free stuff. I've been known to, this is a true story. When I was at the Sugar Bowl two years ago, I walked out of the Superdome with an entire case of water under my arm, shamelessly. I didn't even apologize for it. I didn't feel bad for it. It was just, I knew they were going to throw it away and it was free stuff they give to the media and it's sitting there and I can't stand to see free food or drink go to waste. Can't stand it. So having said that, you understand my excitement when I see these free magazines and these free books. So this is a book by Chris Warner. He sent it to us along with a nice letter. It is the Tailgater's Guide to SEC Football. This is volume five. Now, of course, as you would expect, there's a litany of information about every SEC program in here, but I haven't even gotten to that. I open it up, and he's got a story to open this year's edition about the history of college football. This blew my mind, absolutely blew my mind. The extent of my research about college football probably only goes back to about World War II. I don't think I've done a whole lot of reading about college football before World War II. Really, I haven't done a ton of reading about the sport uh, pre-segregation, just because the sport changed entirely. I feel the same way about baseball. Sports just change entirely when you integrate them to the point where it's nice to know the history, but you're not even reading about the same game. So I haven't done a whole lot of reading to be honest with you, about the game before they wore helmets. But it is fascinating. But boy, I didn't know how fascinating it was going to be. Now, modern day players, if you're in high school right now, if you're a college football player right now, we got a number of you who watch the show. If you talk to old timers, if you talk to guys who played in the 70s, they are going to call you soft. You talk to guys who went through two a days and three a days, and in some cases, four a days. You got to whisper about those. No one was supposed to know. They're going to call you soft. And really what that is, is that's a badge of honor because they went through stuff that you, because legislators have stepped in, don't have to go through. And that's all well and good. And maybe relative to the prior generation or two, maybe it is a more sanitized game now for the better, for the most part. But what if I told you that guys who played in the 70s played a soft brand of football too? Aha! Aha! Coming to America reference, that's true. It's all relative. It's all relative to what era you're in versus what era we're talking about that is bygone in nature. So I open this book up. I'm just going to read it to you because, again, this is a professional author, so he does a better job than I. We're talking about post-Civil War football here, and we're talking about turn of the century uh, going into the 1900s. Listen to this. Football's brush with death. By the turn of the century, in spite of the game's enormous popularity... Concerns nevertheless had materialized over the future of football in America. Brutality and foul play had so tainted the sport that President Theodore Roosevelt felt it necessary to prompt a serious national discussion about the nature of the game. Roosevelt's remarks were justified. Now I'm going to throw some stats at you. These are true. These are real stats. During the 1905 football season, the game's brutal nature, typified by mass formations such as the flying wedge and gang tackling, resulted in 18 fatalities and 159 serious injuries on college football playing fields. Guys, there weren't that many teams playing. You look all over the place. We've got 130 FBS teams these days. They had a fraction of that back then. They had 18 people killed in a season. So what happens there? Well, what happened there? Let me put my napkin bookmark in the book. This has got to be fascinating theater of the imagination if you're listening on the podcast. You ask yourself, how had something not been done before that? We got people dying in mass on the football field. Well, that's a good question. Why hadn't anyone done anything? Someone tried to do something. 
Someone tried to do something indeed. In fact, there was a player, forget the guy's name, there was a player in 1897 for Georgia. This will blow your mind even further. There's a player, Georgia's playing Virginia in Athens in 1897. It's October 30th. And this dude gets knocked out, probably either head trauma or a serious concussion. Nevertheless, they take him over to the sideline, but this was a huge game. I think Georgia plays Virginia this year. Well, this was a huge game. They put the dude on the sideline and forget about him. They go back to playing the game, and they eventually have to take him by horse and buggy to Atlanta, to the hospital where he dies the next day. So here's another fatality. This one's in 1897. I mean, this is eight years before they had the 18 fatalities in one year. And so the governor of Georgia was ready to put forth a bill to ban football, to just do away with it altogether, until someone petitions the state assembly in Georgia. I have to continue to read here. I'm going to tell you who this was after I read the excerpt. Grant me the right to request that this boy's death should not be used to defeat the most cherished object in his life. The governor of Georgia consequently did not sign the bill into law. That was the kid's mother who went and petitioned the state to not ban the game that had killed her son. So someone tried to do something about it. Nevertheless, we move on. Rule changes come in 1905. How does this sound? One of the rule changes that comes in 1905, I'm reading all this for the first time the other night. Mind is blown. I tweeted about it. Mind is blown. One of the rule changes, keep in mind no one's wearing a helmet right now or shoulder pads, one of the rule changes banned the practice of punching ball carriers in the face, which was, according to the author, a common practice. Total brutality. You're thinking about football as just kind of the still pictures that Colin's showing you right now. This was as close to gladiator hand-to-hand -hand combat as existed in the modern-day United States. What they were doing was, I guess, loosely fashioned after what you see these days, this was gladiator combat. You have people dying left and right. So you invent the forward pass and legalize it after the 1905 season. The 10-yard first down comes about after the 1905 season. They establish what is now known as the modern-day line of scrimmage. And those rule changes go into effect for 1906. Yeah, we fast forward two years to 1908, 33 fatalities in the same year which leads to governing bodies, which leads to sanctions and modern rules, which leads to conferences. It basically, a lot of the model of the sport today, which you view as outdated, it was necessitated over a century ago because of this stuff. But think about that. What we had a few years ago, and I don't want to make light of this at all, we had a young man lose his life as part of a workout at Maryland. Do you remember the impact that had on the sport? Think about the impact it had on the program and then how it reverberated throughout the entire sport. And then think a century plus earlier, it was common. I assume you weren't playing 18 games a season or 33 games a season. You had an average of like two players per week dying. Per week, dying. On top of that, and again, this book is The Tailgater's Guide to SEC Football. It's by uh, Chris Warner. Some of the other stories that he tells here, before he even gets into his tailgating guide, talking about tramp players, calm yourself, we're not talking about recruiting or anything like that. Tramp players, I mean, back then, you're not exactly getting DNA tested before you arrive on campus. You just had ringers who traveled campus to campus, and they were for hire. They were pro athletes. Some guys stayed on campus eight years because there was really no way to know. You grow your facial hair out. You know, you change a little about your appearance here or there. You had guys that would play on three or four teams per season. Basically, it's like men's league softball, only it was college football. It was wild. It was the wild, wild South, I guess. And, and this persisted, of course, everywhere. It wasn't just the South. But this is a fascinating book. I would encourage you to buy this book. I think it's the first book we've ever recommended. The Tailgater's Guide to SEC Football by Chris Warner. If for nothing else, than to just read these stories. Those stories are, there are more than just that, but those were the ones that stuck out to me.